Hi, I'm Dr. Carl Fikencher, Professor of Homiletics here at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne and Chairman of the Preach the Word Project. Great having you participate in this module on sermon delivery, delivering the gospel live and in person. So much goes into preparing a sermon, obviously. Uh, the exegetical work, the careful outlining, the considering your congregation for applications and illustrations, the, the writing of the sermon. That delivery of the sermon could seem like kind of an afterthought. You've done all this careful work, practiced a few times, deliver it, there you go. But I actually believe that preaching is best done live and in person. A real live person in the moment actually speaking to real live people. Which means carefully prepared, but not by trying to replicate words on a script. So in this module, that's what we're going to do as well. We'll be together, three pastors, just as you've been doing your triads in the Preach the Word modules, with myself, just talking through, I believe, the best way to talk through the message that deserves the very, very best we can give it, with best being defined as the way that God's precious people can best receive or understand that message of Christ Jesus. I call the process thinking in thoughts. And I hope it'll be very practical for you, whether you believe your sermon delivery could perhaps use a little something extra, or whether you're totally satisfied with where you are and you just want an understanding of what's going on in your brain that makes your sermon delivery so very, very engaging. Let's begin with prayer, shall we? Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have entrusted the eternally saving task of preaching your Son, Jesus Christ, and Him crucified to the fallible and sinful likes of us, the pastors of your church. We are humbled, Heavenly Father. Forgive us, then, for our failures. Use us with the comforting assurance that your word always accomplishes that for which you send it in spite of our foibles and our limitations and our inadequacies. But Father, also make us eager to be the best deliverers of your word that you can make us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one we always proclaim. Amen. We'll begin this module as we begin each of our Preach the Word modules by talking about the theology of what we're doing, the confession and Christocentricity of sermon delivery. Gentlemen, welcome. It's a delight having you here. It's a delight having you be with other triads of pastors throughout the Synod who will be doing the very same thing. Uh, we're going to be talking today about our module on the delivery of the sermon. And uh, we wanted to give the, the folks who are using these modules for Preach the Word kind of a sense here of, of what they might be doing together as well. Having three pastors, guys who enjoy each other, are relaxed with each other, comfortable with each other, working together. And you grin about that because <laughs> we do have with us today Pastor Allersmeyer. Pastor Allersmeyer and Pastor Allersmeyer. This is Steve Allersmeyer from St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Pastor Thomas Allersmeyer from uh, Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne. And Pastor Peter Allersmeyer from Concordia Lutheran Church also in Fort Wayne. Uh, they know each other. They get along well. So we should have a delight uh, getting to, uh, to enjoy being together and talking about sermon delivery. Now, gents. We first want to talk a little bit in each of these modules about the theology of whatever the module is addressing. And of course, we know that preaching is a very, very theological task. We know that every sermon we're going to be preaching Christ crucified. And we know that God uses the preaching of the word to bring people to faith in Christ, to keep them in faith, to sustain them in the faith, to eternal life in heaven. So we know there's huge theology in the content of what we're doing when we preach a sermon. But this module is just about delivering the sermon, sermon delivery. Uh, have any of you guys thought at all about theology behind how we deliver sermons? Any, anything that comes to mind from scripture, either examples or, or, or passages of scripture that suggest to us uh, what's going on theologically when we deliver a sermon? 
Tom? Well, I think, um, for example, the Bible itself, the Bible is um, the writing of human beings, of right. men. They right. have their own style. Sure. Exactly. And yet it's the very Word of God. So um, the idea that each person... Uh, uses his own delivery in the okay. sense and how he puts it together. It's consistent with the way the scriptures were written then. We're right. saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Holy Spirit inspired the writing to be individual for the person and then consistent with that would be the delivery as well. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Any other thoughts on that? I think of the Apostle Paul when I read like uh, Acts and uh, going into various settings mm -hmm. and how he would change perhaps his delivery style depending yep. on the setting that he's in. Mars Hill in Athens right. or a Jewish audience in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia or something like that. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. that's good. Sure. sure. Hey, um, at, at most basic level, let, let's be really clear on one thing. Uh, does the Holy Spirit need our brilliance and delivery to create or strengthen faith? No, of course not, right? The, the, my word does not return void. Isaiah 55, God's very clear on this. And so it, to begin with, anytime we talk about sermon delivery, it's, it's very important and really comforting to realize that if we just get up and, and stumble around and read a, a sermon that is in fact Christ crucified, that gives God's word, and we do it in the most awkward way, uh, the best we can do, the Holy Spirit can use that. Sure, right? sure. Yeah. Okay, there's no question about that. We realize that our delivery, no matter how stellar or how simple, doesn't really add anything right. at all to what's going on in the Word. The Holy Spirit uses the Word, not our ability or, or, or lack thereof. Okay? Correct. And we, we certainly recognize that. We, and, and we come back to that again and again because we know even, even in terms of delivery of the sermon, some days we hit it out of the park and some days we, you know, get fumble mouth and can't, can't go on from there. And, and so that's, that's very, very, very comforting. But I'm going to suggest that nevertheless, we do in sermon delivery want to be the best we can be. And that's because what we're doing is so eternally significant. It is the way the Holy Spirit creates faith, strengthens faith. And because of that, then we really do want to be the best we can be, whatever the best is. And the best, of course, might vary from person to person. Obviously, God gives different levels of talent, different, different abilities, and also best may be understood differently by different people. Uh, a lot of people will suggest that best is a certain kind of oratorical style, which itself is very impressive. The, the golden-throated orators of the uh, 19th century in, in the U.S. Senate that would carry on their debates on the floor, you know, there was a style that was considered very, very good. It was considered probably the best oral style at that time. Uh, but my contention ultimately is that what really is best is whatever enables God's people to get whatever it is we're proclaiming from Scripture, that they get Christ crucified in the way this text uh, is developed. Mm -hmm. I think of a number of cases in Scripture that, that give both some challenge and some comfort of this. Uh, Remember when God called Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Moses, of course, was very hesitant to go. Right. And the, the obvious things, well, Pharaoh won't listen to me. The Israelites won't buy it. You know, they'll say, who sent you? And all that kind of stuff. We understand that. And, and, and those were pretty good objections, really, that God had to answer. Do you remember when Moses was starting to run out of good defenses? Remember what he went to? Speech. I can't speak very well. Right. Exactly. You know, you know I can't speak very well. And what did God say? Do you remember? I love this line. Boy, he said, I'll, I'll be your... He, he's going to help him. Yeah. But first he says, who made your mouth? Ah. I did. I know what you got. Yeah. 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 I gave you some equipment. <clears throat> okay? Uh, now, the fact of the matter must have been that Moses really wasn't too good because then God did give him yeah. Aaron. Yeah. Right? Okay, I'll send Aaron. I know he speaks well. But notice that God says Aaron speaks well. So I, I, I'll go ahead and use Aaron. Okay? I, I do think there's some, some value here in having my guy who goes to, to stand before Pharaoh can, can actually get up and, and, and deliver a good speech. You know, speak my word in a way where the delivery is effective. Mm -hmm. Another guy I think about, of course, and Steve, you mentioned St. Paul. Um, how does Paul describe his own speaking ability? 
He takes this up several times in, in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians as well. Is, is he proud of his, his native gifts? No. I don't no. recall that he is. Not at no. all. No. He, he says, I didn't come to you with lofty speech. Right. And he even says that people complain about him. They say, well, you know, he writes really well. His writing is impressive. But you get him in person and what? Not as good. Not as good. Not too impressive. So we get the sense that St. Paul's oral delivery wasn't that great. And, and, you know, it is true that a lot of people say, well, see, delivery doesn't matter because Paul wasn't any good. But then you think in Acts chapter 14 where St. Paul is in Lystra. And, you know, this is the, the incident where uh, they, they heal the guy and suddenly everybody thinks that Paul and... Barnabas are oh, Hermes and exactly yeah. that they're gods right right and the interesting thing is they say Barnabas is Zeus and Paul is Hermes because Paul was the chief speaker the chief speaker yeah. exactly and so what comes out of this frankly is this Paul may have said oh you know I don't speak well and people may have been critical of his speech but when he was really out there doing it and speaking, they thought he was a god. <laughs> he speaks like a god. Right. So, 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 so Paul probably was not kind of the stumble bum uh, in the pulpit in terms of sermon delivery that we might think he is. Okay? So we got a couple of guys there who undoubtedly did have limited ability, no question about that. But in the case of Aaron as a substitute for Moses or St. Paul, um, the fact of the matter is, um, the word got out pretty effectively, even in terms of the oral delivery. Mm -hmm. Of course, St. Paul is the one who really does give us the, the key passage about why delivery matters. Uh, Romans chapter 10, turn there with me. Romans chapter 10, this is a lengthy section by St. Paul. When do you guys just want to read verse 17 for us? We know this verse, but let's look at that real quickly. Sure. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Okay. Now, um, this really is quite basic when we talk about God's design for how the word is going to get out, right? Because we know that God inscripturated the word. Tom's used in the first place, Tom, uh, uh, God inspired men to write the word, and we, you know, we certainly wouldn't be where we are today, and God wouldn't have left us here without the inscripturated word, without the word in writing, for sure. But um, apparently God really didn't mean for the primary proclamation of the word to be just that written thing. You know, we, we, we need the written word, but the thing we need the written word for is for speaking. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So, just initially, it's, it's pretty clear that God's design is for preaching to be an actual oral event by people. Mm -hmm. And then, if we think about that a little bit more, we realize that when, when St. Paul says faith comes by hearing, he isn't just talking about sound waves bouncing off the eardrums, right? What's, what's he really talking about there when he talks about hearing? an effective comprehension. Right? Exactly, exactly. Faith comes by hearing means that people aren't just having those sounds bouncing around them. They're getting this. Yeah. They're hearing this with comprehension. And uh, Jesus says, for example, in uh, Luke chapter 11, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep, keep, keep it. it. Right. Philoso is the, is the root word in the Greek there for keep it. It's the same word for guarding, you know. So it's not just a matter of just having the sounds happening, but it is a matter of the words being received, being processed, even uh, able, someone able to guard them, use them. You know? and, and this is, of course, way more than just kind of a mechanical thing. This really does mean that the people who are hearing actually are getting what we want them to get. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so then, the big question is, what is it that enables people to hear with comprehension, to hear in a way they can guard it, hold it, keep it, right? And, and my contention is that the way people best get it, 
That is, the way people best receive communication, especially oral communication, is like what we're doing right now. Okay? This isn't scripted. You know, we're not reading anything. We're talking. And, right. and Tom, you nod with, with comprehension right there mm -hmm. when we say that, right? Because what we're doing is actually right now live and in person, person to people communication. We do this all week long, you know, very successfully. We, we get together with our friends and, and we, we make what we have in mind clear. They get it. They're interested in hearing it. They want to hear more. A conversation can easily go much longer than the duration of a normal sermon, right? right. It can easily go 35, 45, yeah. 55 minutes, two hours. And, and the time flies by because we're really engaged with each other right now, here, live and in person. I think this is actually also very theological when we realize that it's totally consistent with the way Scripture talks about the word becoming flesh. flesh. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, of course, the Son of God from eternity has been the Word, the creative Word that created the world and so on. Um, but at the appropriate time, it was God's design that the Word would become a human being. And that meant that from henceforth, as Jesus was on earth, and I believe even since in his representatives, the Word would be proclaimed in flesh. That, of course, was Christ himself. You know, everything he said was God's word. And we can only begin to imagine how brilliant Jesus was, not only in all those words we have recorded, but also in, in the way he delivered them. I mean, you know, we can only imagine that, that he, he sensed every nuance and knew what was going on in each one of his hearers and so on. But even since Christ, in all the men that have been called to be Christ's representatives to God's people, I think it still continues to be very much God's paradigm, God's intention, that preaching God's word be person to people. The word really and fleshed being delivered by a real live person to real live listeners. And that means then that all the things that we do in human communication, just being us, are assumed to be a part of this preaching paradigm. God didn't choose angels to do it, and he didn't leave it to the inscripturated word to be proclaimed. He gave us the, the word in scripture so we would actually deliver it orally. Mm -hmm. And that means I'm delivering it orally, or Tom, or Steve, or Peter, you guys are actually delivering it orally right now in this moment at Concordia from the pulpit on Sunday morning, right? Where it's a real event in real time where you, as a living, breathing human being, with all that that entails, uh, foibles and weaknesses, but a real voice, real mannerisms, hands that do things, feet that do things, all of those, I think, really are God's design for how preaching is to be. Yeah. And that really is very different <clears throat> from the way, frankly, a lot of sermons are delivered, and probably different from the way even a lot of people picture what sermon delivery should be. Because, for example, if what's going on in the pulpit on Sunday morning really is me essentially voice mailing in something that I wrote in the office in front of my computer on Friday, well, that's not that same kind of real live and fleshed delivery of the sermon. Okay? Reading isn't the way people most often communicate. It's not the way we communicate best. It's not the way people receive communication the best. There's a totally different way that we do successfully all week long that almost always manages to succeed to get across the message. And of course, what we're doing here is getting across the eternally saving message of Jesus Christ. And, and if that's what we're doing and preaching, then I just don't think we want to settle for anything less than the very, very best way that God has equipped us to communicate that message. So I really do think that this preaching task is actually a theological thing. And I do think the yeah. theological paradigm, God's paradigm for preaching, is this real live person-to-people communication that we'll be talking about in this module.